something special. This is even more special. Our speaker today is Maciek Levenstein. He grew up around here and then started his spectacular career going from one place to the next. And right now he is a professor at ICFO in Spain near Barcelona. However, important part of his life, scientific life, he has spent at Saclay in France. And there he really participated. He was part of this revolution of attosecond pulses. As you all know, that brought last year Nobel Prize to three physicists, Pierre Agostini, Anne Lullier, and, and Ferenc Krauss. And Magic actually was a part of this small but important revolution. Uh, actually began working on interaction of strong laser light with atoms even before he reached Saclay, but there he was part of most of the discoveries that were made at the time. Uh, Maciek will be telling us about these historic events. However, he also promised to include a, a part of a talk uh, on his current research interests in that, as you probably also know, partially in, uh, involves uh, ultra cold atoms, and there will be part of that about atoms. So, Maciek, your turn, please. Thank you very much, Kajik, and thank you very much, uh, everybody <laughs> responsible for inviting me to this. Uh, I understand this is a colloquium of theoretical physics, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking uh, indeed about uh, auto, auto science, Nobel, and uh, maybe go try to connect it to the subject of ultra cold atoms and things like that. Uh, typical, I start uh, my talks always with the logos of the organizations that contribute to supporting my research and research of my group at ICFO uh, in Castel de Fels near Barcelona. There are um, all possible organizations here, including Foundation of Polish Science and NCN. Uh, many logos means many uh, 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 many possible grants and indeed the group. This is a theory group which in fact was reduced in the last year quite significantly, but still it's 20, uh, 27 people, uh, 16 PhD students, nine postdocs, two master uh, students. We have a lot of collaborations all over the world with the ex-members of the groups, including uh, uh, Poland uh, and in particular uh, Center of Theoretical Physics and Institute of Physics uh, here in this building. This, uh, when I was in Poznań last week, I gave this talk and it was upgraded to the Stanislav Ulam talk. So I had to find connection between Stanislav Ulam and NATO science physics. So uh, this is like Swan is Prawa Polska, so the elephant and the heights of Poland. But anyway, after thinking a little, I found out um, the adventures of a mathematician, the famous autobiography of Ulam. And if you look carefully here, you will find the name of Jan Michelski, who wrote a scientific introduction about mathematics of Ulam to this book. Michelski was a, still is emeritus, Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, he's now 92. Uh, and uh, he was one of the last collaborators of Ulam and his um, uh, very close friend. And I have an honor to meet uh, Michelski at the International Conference of Multiphoton Processes in 1987, which was organized in, at GILA and Joint Institute of um, Laboratory Astrophysics in exactly in Boulder, Colorado. And Kazik, who was before GILA fellow, has introduced me to Jan Michelski. We made some hikes 
uh, in the Colorado mountains. And we already at that time talked about memories. Of, I mean, Marek was also there, if I remember well. And uh, we talked about memories of Saint Safulan. Later in 93, I was a Gila fellow and I was actually meeting Michelski uh, a few times on both on uh, kind of uh, social uh, levels. So going to his house and enjoying his company and chatting about Ulam and uh, also trying even to uh, collaborate with him and applying some ideas from neural networks to his uh, nice works on ergodicity and things like that. Uh, another person that knew, that met Ulam personally, which I learned in Poznan, is Richard Tanash, who showed me the uh, book of uh, Ulam with the personal dedication from Stan. Okay, that's the Ulam part, uh, which here is not appropriate, but still, since I prepared it, I showed it to you because it's nice memory for Kazik and Marek, at least, I think. Uh, so let's start with this one. This is a lunch in Parc Montsouris uh, in Paris. After a symposium, Pierre Agostini, Alfred Maquet, the, this was anniversary of Pierre and uh, Alfred. Alfred was theoretician from, Pierre, from the Université Pierre and Marie Curie, uh, who was collaborating quite a lot with Agostini and others. And this was a part of ATTO, 13 conference, Atto Science uh, 2013 conference. Uh, I have, I am in a t-shirt here, not in the shirt with, uh, tie, with a tie. This is the shirt from Atto 2018 that was in Florida. Uh, the, mm, uh, of course, we are debating here about uh, uh, future Nobel Prizes. And uh, three of the people from this table, Alain Aspe, Ferenc Krauss, and Pierre Agostini, got the Nobel Prize, actually. Unfortunately, only three. OK. This is the, I mean, I really don't understand why these people from the Nobel Foundation employ this uh, artist who makes these drawings. Uh, the, these people look much more nicely in reality. And the first thing I have to assure you is I know them quite well, all of them, and none of them is using the uh, lipstick. None of them. Well, from this figure, it's not clear. OK, the, there will be four parts uh, in this talk. I will give you introduction to super intense laser matter physics in general, and then I will uh, tell you something about new. So this is where I will explain you how the auto uh, second pulses are created. And then there will be part about new things, which is quantum electrodynamics of auto science. And then I will talk maybe a little about the uh, quantum simulators of auto science with ultra cold atoms, and then something about my personal story. So this one has also for parts, uh, so general introduction, I will tell you about processes, and then I will do a little, uh, this is theoretical physics colloqu uh, colloquium or conversatorium, so I will explain you how the description of all these important processes that generate out of second pulses, which is high harmonic generation, work. And this will be done within the so-called strong field approximation, I will derive a formula for uh, spectrum of the high harmonics called landau dinner formula or often called Levenstein model. Uh, and uh, I will not talk about generalization. I rather, maybe I will mention one generalization and I will uh, talk about, I will tell you how to make attosecond pulses. This is all very nicely described in the, in this review that we have written in 2019, if I remember well. Symphony on Strong Field Approximation, which has been very many collaborators over the years who worked on these problems, including uh, quantum chemists even, who also contributed to our understanding of time of solution of time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So Robert Moshinsky and his people. Uh, okay, so what are the basic processes that we study in this area of physics? We have a target, which is matter usually, uh, we shine the laser on the target 
and we see what comes out. This is the basic scheme of all the experiments. So what comes out? There can be photons, which is due to high harmonic generation. There can be electrons, which is due to um, usually above threshold ionization process. And there can be ions, in particular, in multi-electron ionization. The lasers that we use are uh, uh, typically in the range of wavelength between uh, 800 nanometers to, say, 300 nanometers of mid-infrared. The intensities are between, say, 10 to 13 to 10 to 15 watt per centimeter squared. They are high, but they are not uh, extremely high, okay? Nowadays, you can have lasers, tabletop lasers with intensity 10 to 19 watt per centimeter squared or even more. Pulse duration uh, from few femtoseconds to hundreds of femtoseconds, but better to express pulse duration in terms of number of cycles because we have different frequencies. So you can go from few or even one cycle to 15, 30 cycles. And the targets, I will come back to it. It can be anything and we will come back to it. Okay, so these are the typical results that you get. This is a process, a spectrum of electrons are going in above red threshold ionization. Uh, well, actually these people here uh, talk about the um, different regimes. If the photon energy is bigger than ionization potential IP and intensity is not too high, which is measured in ponderomotive energy, ponderomotive energy or ponderomotive potential, which is the average uh, kinetic energy of electron oscillating in the sinusoidal uh, electric field with the frequency omega, so UP is proportional to intensity of the laser uh, divided by frequency squared. Uh, so if you have a laser of high frequency, the, you, have, you are in the regime of single photon ionization. If the IP is bigger than uh, photon energy and uh, still the intensity is small, you are in the regime of multi-photon ionization. This is in 87, the Auto Science Conference was still called International Conference of Multi-Photon Processes, although already at that time, we have been observing non-perturbative uh, effects, which cannot be described in terms of multi-photon high-order perturbation theory. Uh, above threshold ionization is uh, associated here with IP big, still bigger than from the remotive energy and tunnel ionization regime with UP and bigger than IT. I will mix these two and I will hold them both above threshold ionization. But it's true that the real non-perturbative regime is here when UP is bigger than uh, ionization potential and much bigger than uh, photon energy. Typically, the spectra extend to very high number of peaks so in a sense, it, why is it called above threshold ionization? Electron absorbs more photons than it needs to go to the continuum. Uh, in fact, the spectrum, in, especially in this regime, uh, when UP is bigger than IP, uh, can even exhibit different kinds of plateaus and uh, uh, extend to very, very high energies. This is a spectrum. Uh, this is these are the two spectra of high harmonic generation. Um, so the first one is for relatively long pulse of uh, ten cycle pulse. So the spectrum of high harmonics is discrete. Um, uh, you have uh, discrete peaks which extend to very high harmonics. In, the, in this case, it's like. 40s harmonics, it is uh, in Krypton, illuminated with laser of uh, 1200 um, nanometers. Uh, and this spectrum represents a kind of plateau, which is uh, which does not decay, like in the perturbation theory, it extends to very high harmonics. And in the lower panel, you see the spectrum of single isolated attosecond pulse. So of course, it's a very broad peak like a continuum uh, spectrum, which covers very high energies, as you can see, including water windows in many uh, uh, materials, in many molecules and uh, elements. This is another process which is considered often. This is called laser-induced electron diffraction and typical spectrum of, of laser-induced 
uh, electron diffraction. So this is uh, returning kinetic energy of the electron uh, and uh, corresponding normalized electron counts. So here the idea is the following. Electron goes out from the, or tunnels out, if you wish, from the parent ion, goes to the continuum, is accelerated in the laser field, comes back to the target, uh, to the parent ion and scatters on this parent ion. And in the scattering process gets information in the, this diffraction process, if you wish, you get information about the structure of the target. For instance, you can study mole complex molecules in this way and uh, get information about their molecular orbitals. And the final thing I want to mention is this multi-electron uh, ionization. It has several, so to say, phases. Uh, se uh, sequential uh, double, ion let's say, we start with double ionization. Sequential double ionization means one electron goes away, for instance, via tunneling, and then the second independently goes away via tunneling. Non-sequential double ionization, this has at least two mechanisms. One is so-called <coughs> electron, by ion, uh, electron ionization by uh, electron impact ionization, sorry, EII. So this is the thing that one electron goes to the continuum is accelerated in the laser field, goes back and hits second electron uh, or ionizes the second electron so that the two are in the continuum. <coughs> Another mechanism is resi, which is resonant excitation subsequent ionization. This first electron goes to the continuum, goes back to the parent ion and excites second electron in the parent ion to highly excited states, state from which the second electron ionizes, for instance, by tunneling uh, ionization very easy because it's in a very highly excited state. The typical spectrum for, for electron, not spectrum in this case, angular distribution of momentum of the outgoing electrons <coughs> for the um, electron impact ionization has this wonderful butterfly uh, shape. Uh, of course, the, um, the momentum distributions for the outgoing electrons for the um, resi, resi process are much more complex because they include all the coherent information about the excited state here. So they can be very, very, very rich. Okay, targets, atoms in a jet, atoms in a cell, simple molecules, large complex molecules, uh, atomic clusters, Fuller ends, liquids, standard solids. By standard solids, I mean, let's say, standard superconductors without any topological properties or, or any, or described by the, let's say, uh, Fermi liquid theory without any strong correlations. Topological materials, strongly correlated materials, 2D materials, even 1D quantum wires. So now I will explain you a little of the theory of the strong field approximation so that you understand the mechanism of generating high harmonics. So the aim here is to solve a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which has this form. The derivative of wave function is given by Hamiltonian times wave function, but we do it in the approximation which is called single active electron approximation. So in most of these processes, of course, not in the double ionization, because then you have, by uh, definition, two electrons involved. But in high harmonics generation and above threshold ionization, it's a single active electron from the external shell, which really plays an important role. So this electron feels effective potential, which is for hydrogen just a Coulomb potential, but in general, it's a kind of effective Coulomb-like potential that takes into account the effect of inner shell electrons, okay? But it's a single active electron, which is important. And now the Hamiltonian has two parts. Uh, the laser-free Hamiltonian, which I have written here, uh, which is, um, sorry, uh, which is, um, which contains kinetic energy and uh, this Coulomb-like effective uh, potential uh, that acts on the single active electron. 
and interaction with the uh, laser field, which you can uh, approximate in the dipole approximation. So you can take a dipole moment of electron, charge times the position and times electric field, which is just a, a real number. So the um, electric field is in simple case. If I have linear polarization in Z direction, it will be given by uh, electric field amplitude times sine of the fundamental frequency times T, fundamental frequency of the laser phase, because the pulses are short, so called carrier envelope phase can play a role, because if I have one single uh, cycle, it is a difference if I go like that, or if I go like that, right? So uh, this depends on this carrier envelope phase. And you have a function f of t, which essentially goes from zero to one and describes the envelope, time dependent envelope of the of your laser pulse. Of course, very easily you can generalize this to arbitrary polarization by replacing this uh, linear polarization, electric field amplitude times vector Z by some general time dependent vector. You can generalize this thing also to two frequency fields, three frequency fields, whatever you want. And the uh, important thing, however, is that in all these standard approaches, uh, strong electromagnetic field is treated classically as a real number. Uh, and this is clear because electric field is strong. It is prepared in the coherence. It is coherent, so quantum mechanically is prepared in a coherent state. But the quantum fluctuations of uh, this electric field are very small and negligible. We will see that this is not always the case uh, in the future. So how do we understand the process of generation of high harmonics? This goes back to the papers by Paul Korkum and Ken Kulander with his collaborators, Ken Sheffer and uh, Jeff Cross, uh, in which, mm, in particular in the paper, in the Fizzer letter in 93, Kulander and his collaborators calculated the spectrum of high harmonics for many atoms and they observed that the spectrum has universal properties. For few low harmonics, there is a fast follow, which looks like uh, um, perturbation theory kind of dependence, so exponential fall, falling down. Then there is this plateau, which is evidently non-perturbative, and then there is a rapid cutoff. Now, as, uh, interestingly, the position of the cutoff is universal. It's given by the ionization potential IP plus 3.2 ponderomotive energy, which I explained you. It's the average kinetic energy of electron oscillating in the field with frequency, with laser frequency. And this has found uh, quickly, uh, well, a year later, explanation in the so-called simple man's or three-step model, which explained the whole thing in the following way. Uh, we start with the electron in the ground state in the atom, which is in the oscillating field of the laser. Remember that the frequency of the laser is much, much smaller in these regimes than the IP. IP for let's hydrogen will be what, 13 electron volts. And uh, for even 800 nanometers, the uh, H omega L is of order of, uh, it's more than one electron volt, but something like that. It's of order of one electron volt. So you need 10 photons perturbatively to go to the continuum. Okay, so that means that the laser, which has this linear potential and it, it oscillates, it gives a linear potential for the electron. It, it oscillates, but it oscillates slowly. So if it's electric field is maximal, electron has time to tunnel from the ground state outside through this barrier, which is here. And this is the first step. Electron tunnels out. When it tunnels out, it is essentially free because it doesn't feel really the effect of this pseudo Coulomb or Coulomb-like potential, but it feels a strong laser field. So it is accelerated in the strong laser field. It goes first, uh, well, if it goes here in this direction, so it goes in this direction, but then the electric field changes sign, so it comes back to the parent ion. 
And when it comes back to the parent ion, uh, it may it uh, may recombine on the parent ion, producing a photon. What will be the maximal energy of this photon? The maximal energy of this photon, well, you, it goes back to the ground state, so it will be IP, ionization potential, first of all. But on top of that, there will be the maximal kinetic energy that the electron gained in this accelerated motion. You can take Newton equation classical and calculate it, what is the maximal uh, kinetic energy in this case, and you will find that it is about 3.2 UP. This explains classically this uh, universality in the spectrum. And uh, we have tried to formulate the fully quantum mechanical theory of that in the beginning of the 90s together with Anne Lullier. Uh, and Misha Ivanov, and uh, this is based on three assumptions. The first assumption is that, of course, only two kinds of states participate in this process. The ground state, electron, um, electronic ground state, and scattering states of electron, which uh, I enumerate with the outgoing kinetic momentum P. I mean, I assume in this kind of, in my approach to strong field approximation, that I know uh, the time dependence of the amplitude of the ground state. I will tell you how to calculate it simply in the moment, but let's assume that we know it, okay? And then the third assumption will be that the continuum state are taken from a basis of exact scattering states, uh, which are eigenstate of the laser-free Hamiltonian with this uh, eigenvalue. So P, I, rem I remind you, is a kinetic momentum of the outgoing electron. Now, people uh, very often make, in my opinion, false assumption that is saying that outgoing electrons behave like plane waves. No, only in a certain approximation. If you look at the continuum, continuum mat dipole matrix element, that indeed it has a part which is very singular and which looks like derivative of the Dirac delta function, which is analog of the contribution of the type of plane waves. But there are corrections which are important, important and in particular, very important for processes like above threshold ionization or multi electron ionization. So let's analyze these um, assumptions a little more in detail. So the wave function will be now written as a combination of two terms amplitude of the ground state times the ground state plus integral over amplitudes of continuum states times continuum states. I went to a um, interaction picture with respect to free energy uh, of uh, the laser free states so in other words i shifted now the zero of the energy to the ground state ground state has zero energy now but that means that the continuum starts from ip okay Okay, so how can I evaluate uh, that this uh, amplitude of the ground state? Well, using time-dependent Schrodinger equation itself. You may say, well, this is idiotic because this is what you want to solve. So uh, uh, if you can solve it, then solve it and forget about approximation. No, it is much more easy to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the amplitude of the ground state than for the um, spectra or angular distribution of electrons. This is much more demanding numerically problem. And amplitude is easier to calculate. But I can do approximation also here. Space, face, classical phase space averaging or what people sometimes, sometimes called truncated Wigner approximation. I can use, and this is mostly occur via tunneling and therefore I can use uh, tunneling rates for ionization and therefore estimate this A of T. And this can be done according to the seminal classic papers of, of uh, Keldish, or I can use a better, uh, more precise theory of Amosov, Delone, and Krainov to calculate the tunneling rates, because these rates of uh, these three people include all the details of atomic um, symmetries, etc., etc. The simplest thing is to set <coughs> amplitude of the ground state to one. In high harmonic generation, we don't want to have big depletion of the ground state because we don't get any signal then. We want the depletion to remain controlled, small. 
And then we can use slow, uh, strong field approximation self-consistently itself. All these methods are okay. And finally, the last one is uh, uh, continuum continuum dipole matrix element. So this thing, dipolar matrix element, as I told you, it has the most singular part, which is derivative of the Dirac delta, which is reminiscence of the plane waves. But of course, in the Coulomb-like potentials, there are very strong co uh, corrections to that, which are also uh, singular on the energy shell, and which play a role in particular in above threshold ionization and multi electronization. In harmonics generation, in the zeros approximation, I can forget about those corrections. Okay, so now I will derive this Landau Dinner formula for you. Uh, so the Schrodinger equation now reduced to the ground state have the following form ground state is coupled through the dipole matrix element defined like that uh, at the kinetic momentum p uh, at the time t to the uh, elect through the electric field e to the continuum the continuum has a free evolution part which i told you doesn't start from zero but is shifted up by IP, so the continuum states have the, have the minimum energy IP. It couples to the ground state through dipole matrix element and electric field. It contains the singular part of the, of the continuum continuum matrix element, and it continues the correction to the continuum continuum matrix element. These corrections we will neglect in theory of high harmonic uh, generation. We don't do it in ATI or in multi electronization. Now, if I neglect this term here, the equation that I have for the amplitude B of PT is a first order partial differential equation with respect to time and uh, momentum, kinetic momentum in this case, uh, with inhomogeneity, which is proportional to amplitude of the ground state, which I know, I assume. So obviously this equation is exactly soluble using, for instance, characteristic method, and this is what we do. Once more. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. No, I told you it's general. Yes. So in principle, uh, where is the information about the atom? Of course, in the IP, but also in the character in this dipole moment matrix elements, because I told you I should take ground state of the given atom calculated by Hartree Fock. I have to ask atom if I want to be really precise, I have to ask atomic physicists to give me Hartree Fock approximation for the ground state of the single active electron, and I have to take uh, the Hartree Fock approximation to the uh, continuum state with given kinetic outgoing uh, momentum from the, this effective potential. So I really need uh, atomic physics. Of course, the people usually make approximation and do pseudo Coulomb with some adjustment, just fitting the energy to the proper thing, or how do you call it, defect theory and this kind of stuff. But in principle, this is like it is. Okay, so now... Uh, so when I solve this thing exactly, this is the landau dinner for formula for the um, amplitude in the continuum. It has a very simple uh, character. It is integral from zero to the final time t. At time t prime, I tunnel to the continuum. And uh, this time I change the variable to canonical momentum, but I tunnel with the dipole matrix element calculated at kinetic momentum, P minus E times electromagnetic potential at time T prime. And this transition is proportional to the electric field at time T prime. In the continuum, I propagate like in the Feynman pass integral theory with the quasi-classical action, which is given by this formula. It's an integral uh, from T prime to T to final time T of kinetic energy minus potential energy. But potential energy here is minus IP. So minus uh, uh, ionization potential, or it's a 
okay? And therefore, minus minus IP is plus IP. I can calculate the average value of the dipole moment from that, et cetera, et cetera. And this is usually known, this formula finally is, is called uh, uh, this Levenstein model, if you wish. I can calculate Fourier, <coughs> uh, Fourier uh, transform of this time-dependent dipole moment, and this will give me information about the spectrum of harmonics. This is a five-fold integral in uh, momentum, in this case canonical momentum, time and T prime, which is the time of time, which is the Fourier uh, transform, and T prime, which corresponds to tunneling time. Now, five-fold integrals, but it has this rapidly oscillating exponent here because the quasi-classical action is divided by h-bar. Like in Feynman theory, I apply now subtle point approximation. The subtle point approximation gives me three very simple equations. And the first, oh, the first two derivatives with respect to time correspond to, to the conservation of energy. So at the tunneling time, the derivative of the action gives me that kinetic energy plus IP is equal to zero. Obviously, I have no solution for this equation for uh, the real, in the real numbers domain. And this is good because this corresponds to the tunneling, which is passing through the classically forbidden barrier. So I have to have uh, kinetic energy negative at this instant, or in another words, velocity, which is purely imaginary. The second is more normal uh, uh, conservation energy. This is at the final time of recombination. So kinetic energy plus IP is equal to the energy of the outgoing photon. And uh, these photons will be, of course, uh, only uh, have discrete, so to say, energies in the spectrum because everything is periodic, at least in few few cycle uh, pulses, so only uh, uh, special values of this uh, uh, frequency omega will play an important role. And finally, the last three equations, derivative with respect to the canonical momentum, tells me that the integral from t prime to t of the velocity or kinetic momentum of my uh, electron is equal to zero. So if the integral of velocity from t prime to t is zero, that means electron goes from here and comes back to the same place because integral of the velocity is a difference between position at t and position at t. Okay, how can you generalize it? I mean, I mean, sorry, first before I tell this, I uh, tell you that of course these equations and that I showed you is nothing else but the quantum mechanical version of the simple man's model. It's really, a, it's so to say, um, construction of the simple man's or three-step model in the fully quantum mechanical picture. So generalizations are many, but I show you one because this is now a very hot subject, and in particular for uh, strongly correlated materials. This is a work by my colleague from ICFO, Jens Bigger, the uh, experiment led by Igor Kulinev. Uh, we, we did the theory with the Marcello Chapina and also Batacharya, Bata uh, who are exic, or Tobias Gras, all are exic phonians, and uh, Piotr Grochowski from here was there. Uh, so it's a paper where they studied the uh, following pro problem they shined a media infrared laser field, I think about 3,000 nanometers, but I don't remember exactly, on the surface of the so-called IPCO. It's one of the standard cuprate type uh, superconductors, and they see what comes out. And uh, they are essentially able to go through this uh, vertical line here on the phase diagram. The phase diagram is expected to have strange metal phase, so-called pseudo gap phase, and superconductor here. And this is the result. The result uh, shows very nicely that in the, the region of different, they measure first three harmonics, not so much, but anyway, they, uh, in this um, system, the behavior of uh, the dependence of the harmonics 
uh, strength as a function of temperature is very different in different phases. So the high harmonics can serve here to detect the phase transition. So here, this regime is a, a strange metal, then pseudo gap, and then uh, superconductor, where you observe a high increase of the harmonic generation due to appearance of new source of harmonics, a new current of electrons, which is a supercurrent of copper. But the theory that we're using here is a kind of generalized par pairing theory, or if you wish, time dependent Gaussian fermionic states. It's, of course, not good for strongly correlated materials at the phase transition, but it works quite well otherwise, and it compares very well with experiments. Okay, so now I tell you how to make at a second pulses. We have two situations. One is that we have uh, long pulses, and therefore the spectrum contains a lot of discrete harmonics, this plateau, as I told you. And uh, then we can get at a second pulse train, because if we transform this uh, spectrum of harmonics into a time domain, we obtain at a second domain, provided, and I will tell you, provided what? Provided harmonic are phase log. In the case of uh, continuous uh, harmonics created by the single or two uh, cycle pulse, you get, uh, you, t you, uh, you take uh, the part of the spectrum in the, in the cutoff region, and if you Fourier transform it to the time, you will get single at a second pulse. So the first mechanism was discussed in this paper by Philip Antoine Anne and me. <clears throat> this is one of these papers cited in the Nobel um, page. So what we study here is the question, are the, are the harmonics phase locked? So here are the phases of the harmonics in the plateau, then uh, outside of the cutoff region, harmonics are practically zero, so they are not interesting. And as you can see, the phases are essentially random. If you look at the time signal, you see that it's quite of chaotic. This is not the auto second pulse trains. There are many components. And this is due to the fact that harmonics generation comes from various electronic uh, trajectories. The dominant one are the one short Time, with short time T1 and uh, a little longer time uh, tau2. Uh, but in principle, there are more, and this, they contribute with different random phases. So here is a schematic uh, picture how these two times are related. But uh, in principle, there should not be train of attosecond pulses. But as you can see, uh, if you... Uh, oh, maybe I had, oh, sorry. Like this plus and minus is for me. Anyway. So in principle, there is no phase matching. But the problem, is, or the problem, but the observation that we made in this paper is that the important thing for harmonic generation is phase matching. I mean, if you just take, an, uh, in, in order to have a macroscopic signal of harmonics, the, the atoms have to co collaborate and um, send a signal which is phase matched. So. The point is that the phase matching conditions for the traje electronic trajectories with short times T1 or with longer time T2 are completely different. For T1, for shorter times, harmonics are focused in the middle of the axis and, uh, and, uh, and they are phase matched. If you actually focus, I don't remember this, if you focus your laser beam, if you put, sorry, the atoms before the focus of the laser beam, the reason is that the Gaussian laser beam itself has a phase, the GUG phase, uh, which also plays a role in phase matching. Uh, and the second uh, type of trajectories with tau2 is better phase matched if you put the, the atoms after the focusing, if I remember well. I don't know, after, before is um, up to my memory. But anyway, you have two conditions. This long trajectories, you, should, okay, you, can, you can face match them, but they will never be focused on the axis. They will rather form a kind of expanding curve. But anyway, if you do that, you get a very beautiful, as you can see, attosecond pulse trains. So this is for the shorter time, tau1, and this is for this longer time, t2, using the effect of phase match. And this is essentially what the, Agostini did in his experiment, but of course, in another words, what did he do? 
Well, he, he, did, he didn't have to do anything. In the paper from 96, we showed at the second pulse, trains are there. If you just put the thing into medium, you face much properly and or you focus in a proper place, you have them. You don't have to do anything. No, you have to measure them a proof that they are at a second length. And for this, he invented the reconstruction of at a second beating by interference of two photon transitions or a method which is commonly known as rabbit, which is uh, explained more or less here. You consider different ways of going to the state here, uh, either by bigger harmonic. My so you combine harmonics with the infrared laser and you, you go to the given state by absorbing one harmonic and emitting uh, um, infrared photon or emitting infrared photon and absorbing other harmonic, absorbing, absorbing smaller harmonic and, and uh, infrared photon, etc. Et there are four ways which interfere and you can measure the effects of this interference as a function of delay between the infrared pulse and the harmonic uh, train. And this is how he measured the duration of his pulses, which in this first experiment was 250 half a second. Uh, it's a different situation with the isolated out of second pulses. For this thing, we need to have a driving laser pulses, which are ultra short, and that they are, say, one cycle long or two cycle long or something like that. And this goes to the wonderful works of Mauro Nisoli and uh, Ottavio Svelto, one of the biggest figures in Italian um, uh, laser physics at the Politecnica de, de Milano, uh, who have observed that if you put a, a ultra short pulse into a hollow fiber, due to nonlinear interaction in the fiber, you can shorten the pulse exactly to one or few pulses. So here, here is the first experiment when they produce a 10 femtosecond pulse. So this is like two and a half maybe cycles or three cycles. Um, the, um, this method was used actually by Ferenc Krauss to generate isolated, uh, isolated uh, attosecond pulses. And this is the experimental scheme and in the uh, in order to measure, again, the generation is one thing, but to proving that it's an attosecond pulse, they use the attosecond street camera um, idea, which goes back to Korkum and Ivanov. So the electron generated by X-ray ionization is deflected by strong laser field. So do the same idea. They put electrons ionization uh, ionized by uh, the harmonics to the strong laser field. So the field of the fundamental, if you wish. And then they look at the delay and they look how the electron energy is deflect, deflected. And from that, they infer information about the duration of the attosecond pulse. And that's it. In that case, uh, it was about, uh, I think this was the theoretical analysis. It was about 70 attoseconds. <laughs> Nowadays, the record of the duration of pulses is 40 attosecond more. I will tell you something about the newest things. This is uh, about quantum electrodynamics of uh, uh, these processes. This goes back to this Nature Physics paper um, from 21 with a um, Crete group of Paris Salas. And the idea is here that we do the same. We solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, but now we treat the field quantum mechanically. So everything is the same, laser free Hamiltonian, but now the interaction of the uh, laser with the uh, with the electron is via quantized electric field, and the uh, electromagnetic field has its own Hamiltonian, but it's still single uh, electron arc, single active electron approximation and things like that. So what you do here, I mean, in the first paper we did a very trivial theory where we assumed that the spectrum that the uh, electromagnetic field has only discrete modes. Uh, so we had to model somehow the time dependent uh, pulse duration of the interaction of electron with the electric field. So we did it by uh, defining electric field as 
coupling constant, which is standard for quantum electrodynamics, expansion for the modes, but then this time dependent factor that goes from zero to one that describes the that mimics the pulse shape. If we take a continuum spectrum, of course, we don't need these tricks. We can describe the, the pulses by just integrals. But And this we did later, but in the first paper, it was like that. And then you do a series of approximations, which are essentially going to uh, interaction pictures. I mean, initially, the ground state, uh, the initial state of the shredding equation that I solved is ground state of the electron, uh, coherent state of the laser with amplitude alpha, and uh, uh, vacuum of the harmonics. Okay, but then I shift uh, uh, to the using Glauber shifting operator. I shift uh, this coherent state to zero, but then I have uh, part of the Hamiltonian which describes simply. Uh, uh, dynamics of my electron in the classical electric field or in the average electric field, but there is still a quantum correction here. Then I go to interaction picture with respect to this classical or semi-classical uh, Hamiltonian, um, and uh, okay. And the final equation then that I have is this one, where R is the um, position of the electron evolves in the Heisenberg picture with respect to the semi-classical Hamiltonian, and uh, this is a quantum part of electromagnetic field. I do, can do approximation which is similar to strong field spirit. I uh, define now identity operator as projection on ground state and uh, excited states, but I'm looking at harmonics, so I forget about excited states and uh, the final equation uh, for the wave function is this one, that the uh, projected on the ground state wave function is the quantized part of uh, electric field times average value of the dipole moment, which we have calculated in the previous part. It's in the classical electric field. So I can use, for instance, strong field approximation to calculate it times the electric field. Solution is trivial exponent, time depend, time ordered exponent of this operator. This operator is linear in creation and regulation operator of electromagnetic modes. So what does it do? It shifts the coherent state. It's a Glauber shift operator. So the final state of the uh, of the of the electromagnetic field in the for a single atom is this the Coherent state of the laser is shifted because of interaction, and harmonics become coherent. Okay, I will skip the oscillators. Uh, or I will prolong simply by force. Okay, but of course you don't have one atom in the process. You have n atoms that collaborate in the in this photo in the. Uh, phase matching uh, process, and if you multiply the shift by n, they are quite significant. And this is what we observe here. Essentially, what this Paris is doing, he puts coherent state here, he lets this uh, interact, so this coherent uh, state is uh, shifted, and uh, I mean, just to make it caricature what he does, he uh, uh, conditions now this state on the production of harmonics. He also diminished its amplitude in order to be able to measure it uh, in a, let's say, quantum optics way. But this is technical. This is coherent diminishing of amplitude from big to, let's say, corresponding to 10 photons or 20 photons. And then the end uh, state that he gets here is a shifted coherent state for the fundamental minus essentially a projector of the original coherent state. So it's a kind of optical Schrodinger cut state. And this was indeed measured in these experiments. If you don't do anything, no conditioning, the Wigner function that he measures is just a Gaussian, like for coherent state. If he measures, he gets a beautiful Schrodinger cut with negative parts and so on. This is the keep of people who were in it for who are in Heraklion, but now are in many places. Uh, and you can generalize this thing to conditioning of ATI. You can do it more, uh, which also leads to the Schrodinger cats. 
you can really do it more carefully because the final shredding is, the final state of the of this conditioning pro process is really this one is a shifted coherent of the fundamental coherent states of the harmonics minus projector of this state on vacuum for harmonics and on not shifted state okay. so this state is uh, not only a kind of Schrodinger cat, but it also contains a lot of correlations between the harmonics. Again, very, there is a Fizzrev letter coming where we show that without conditioning, but for not so small depletion regime, so close to saturation for harmonics, you can even get squeezing without any conditioning from this kind of process. And since there is no time, I will go to this uh, final private thing. which uh, is just the memory. So, as uh, Kajik already mentioned, uh, I started to work here uh, in Center for Theoretical Physics on, and Institute of Physics also because I collaborated with the people. And in uh, 93, I guess, around, sorry, in 83 or 84, Professor Zofia Białyniska birula wrote a very influential paper on above threshold ionization, which is described in a quantum optical way, transitions of electrons in the continuum. Eberly published a PRL using exactly the same ideas, but Eberly was a better uh, merchan merchandise or whatever. And this is, uh, Kazik was spent some time in Trieste, I don't remember when, but he brought a preprint of Louis Davidovich uh, on the interpretation of Keldish approximation. I think I have stolen this. Uh, preprint from Kazik's desk, but maybe he gave me, I don't know. And I started to work on these problems, mostly in the context of ionization at that time, uh, here with the people from Institute of Physics, with Marek, with Jan Mostowski, with uh, young students, Grochmolicki and Kuklinski. And of course, influenced but, uh, by the works of Everly. In 92, I became a postdoc, or maybe better to say research, Associate because I was already a private docent, as they say, and I, even I think my application for the professor was in was running. I became a, therefore a postdoc of Anne for six months at uh, Service de Photon and Molecule in Serra. And this was where I started to work on high harmonics, which I explained to you already, the way to describe the attosecond pulses. And this is where, uh, after these two papers by Kulander, and um, by Kulander, Schaeffer, and Krauss, and uh, Paul Karkum, I, I wrote uh, this uh, seminar paper on theory of high harmonic generation by low frequency laser field, which is a quantum mechanical version of three step model. Uh, in the celebrations of uh, 50 years of uh, FISREV, a few years ago, it was identified as the most cited paper in uh, FISREV. Uh, and uh, it has now about 5,000 citations in the uh, Google. And of course, the reason why it is cited so strongly is the same uh, as uh, why Glauber got the Nobel Prize and not Sudarshan, because this paper was used by experimentalists. It was written in such a way that it was written with experimentalists, and therefore it was from the very beginning used by experimentalists and it is used. It, it has like 200, 150 citations every year. Okay, this I already mentioned to you, so I don't have to tell you. I maybe mentioned this paper because on the occasion of 90th anniversary of Vivo, we have written a short uh, essay entitled Quantum Optics as Qu uh, Applied Quantum Electrodynamics is back in town. The reason was that when we came with Marek Kusch to do diploma with Kevish and Zanzeski, and we wanted to work on quantum field theory, they told us, come on, quantum optics is applied quantum field theory. So quantum optics as applied quantum theory is back in town. This is my gallery. As you can see in my gallery, I have uh, three novels, Anne, Pierre Agostini, and Ferenc. I have two papers with Ferenc, only one, strangely enough, with, uh, with uh, Pierre maybe about 20 we're done. This is Misha Ivanov, this is uh, Paul Korkum mentioned. No, I'm sorry, this is Ken Kulander mentioned. This is Paul Korkum mentioned. This is Ken Schaeffer. 
And this is the photos. Uh, this is the lecture of Anne. I was invited by Anne to the Nobel ceremony. Anne is uh, showing my photo and uh, citing the famous uh, paper uh, that I mentioned. And this is the lecture of uh, Pierre Agostini when he cites the lecture about auto second the paper about auto second pulse trains. And this is the true three of them after the lectures. This is the photo in the hotel. This is Anne Lumier. This is Klaus Joran Wallström, Pascal Salier, and Mette Gorde. Uh, this is me and Pascal as penguins, as you can see. Uh, this is the king giving the diploma to Anne. This is illegal photo. That's why it has bad quality. They didn't allow to do photos. They, there is official photos in there page of the uh, of the foundation this is an addressing the king and 1100 people in the stockholm town hall and i think this is it thank you very much okay thank you for this nice and important presentation we really have time for important short questions because we are already over time, but I'm please sorry. go ahead. Hi, thank you for a beautiful lecture. I have a controversial question. Could you maybe comment a little bit on the new notion of non-zero tunneling time, which is pushed very strongly, for example, by Ursula Keller in the Atta community? Well, okay, I have very negative opinion about this. It is a kind of, I mean, the experiments at the end are interesting, but I think it's invented in a sense problem. And uh, so I, I cannot tell you, I, I, I would say the following thing. For me, if you think about tunneling time, you should uh, ask yourself, you, you should apply the quantum measurement theory. You should apply, are you, so there is a barrier here, okay? So a, you should apply, is your particle here? And then is your particle there? And if you do this experiment and this kind of experiment, then usually this tunneling time will be always zero in this, when you do this approach. So they don't do it really. They, they imaginary uh, do about some shifts in the energy and so on. I mean, it's a nice experiment, but whether you should interpret it in terms like I understand uh, in the measurement, uh, quantum measurement theory, what is the tunneling? Mm, I think I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't dare to do it. I would call it some time shifts or something like that, but not really the tunneling time. This idea that... I'm sure you know yes what do you think about Landauer same thing that goes very nicely with a Kyodis distinction between tunneling, tunneling and multiphoton and tunneling, no. no I'm not saying I'm only saying I mean I'm a rigorous quantum fundamentalist all right so if I would like, if somebody would ask me how to define the tunneling time, I would tell you, well, do what I'm saying. Yeah. Before, before the process, after the process, what is the time difference? It is like with quantum times. They will be zero. They have zero duration in principle. But it doesn't mean that all these ideas that these people are developing are stupid. No, but I wouldn't interpret them as a measuring of yeah. tunneling time. I would rather... Uh, interpret them as a kind of coherent effects in the process of tunneling which are there. And the measurement is very nice and uh, useful, but I wouldn't interpret it, it like that. And they insist on it with the kind of religious approach. And that's why I, mm, a little negative. Let, let me go back to the auto physics. As far as I remember, and probably you can confirm, for the first time, this notion of auto second pass has appeared uh, in Farkas' papers. Uh, do you remember how 
badly he was treated by the community when he first came came up with this idea i don't remember that was a conference in and sur less in, 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 in Belgium. No, but then already it was kind of accepted the idea. Well, not, not when we met f the first time, because there were two of those conferences. Ah, no, because I'm talking about the one in 93. Yeah, yeah. 93, that's this is where Korkum and the others were. Right. Uh, that's right. Maybe yeah. Korkum not, but Kulander. Kulander was and, there. Uh, uh, no, I don't remember. I do. No, I don't remember. I probably was not there. Probably, yes. OK, uh, really important and quick question. Else we are about to close the session. Okay. Maybe maybe we give a chance to a couple of people that are uh, online who could ah. not join because of the um, uh, various uh, health reasons. So uh, are there any questions from the online audience? Okay, it doesn't look to be the case. So maybe we have uh, maybe we have then time for, like Kajik mentioned, one last uh, quick important question. If anyone has, okay, doesn't seem to be the case. So okay, so let's thank the speaker.